Thanks very much, uh, Bob, and um, a huge uh, thank you to Brain and Behavior uh, Foundation for this uh, incredible honor. Uh, as you heard, uh, the focus of our program is translational uh, research. And as I see it, there are two broader uh, issues uh, as they pertain to bipolar disorder. Uh, the first one, of course, is the knowledge gaps, which, uh, of course, doesn't come as a huge surprise to you, uh, because there are a number of areas in, the, in bipolar disorder where we still have significant uh, knowledge gaps, and I've listed uh, some of those uh, on this slide. Uh, for instance, uh, we still don't have a good idea about the precise neurochemical alterations that lead to expression of uh, manic or depressive symptoms. Uh, we also still don't have a good idea about the course and evolution of a bipolar disease. Uh, we have lots of treatments for, uh, for mania, uh, but those treatments have a number of limitations. Uh, we have very few uh, treatments uh, for bipolar depression. Now, having said, uh, said that, we have made significant progress uh, over the past 20 years. So uh, prior to 1994, uh, we primarily had lithium and carbamazepine and some of the older antipsychotics for treating bipolar disorder. And of course, over the last 20 years, uh, we've actually, there have been a number of new uh, medications that are currently available uh, for treating bipolar. But the biggest challenge is we haven't been very effective in transferring that knowledge to, uh, to frontline clinicians who look after uh, patients with bipolar disorder. So the focus of our, our program uh, really has been to try and address uh, some of those issues. So we do brain imaging studies to understand the neurochemical, neurostructural alterations in people with bipolar disorder. We do prospective cohort studies to understand the course and evolution of the disease. We do a bunch of clinical trials to look at uh, developing new treatments. And of course, we also do a lot of knowledge translational uh, activities as well. So over the course of the next 13 minutes now, I think, I'm going to try and see if I can give you an example of each of those strategies. I'll start with the dopamine story. I, was, I could have given you serotonin story. Uh, I didn't really know that the other speakers were going to talk about the dopamine, but that's, that's okay. I'm going to tell you the dopamine story from a bipolar uh, perspective. So here is a cartoon of uh, a dopamine neuron. Now the thing about mania, which is a, a part of bipolar disorder, is that manic symptoms can be effectively treated with drugs that block this dopamine 2 receptors. Whether that manic patient has a psychotic symptoms or not, the drugs that block dopamine 2 receptors are very effective in treating manic symptoms. So we wanted to understand, if we look at patients with a non-psychotic mania, do they actually have abnormality in dopaminergic system? And that's a question that we set out to answer using uh, PET scans. So in the first study, we measured the dopamine D2 receptors in first episode non-psychotic manic patients in comparison to healthy controls, expecting that these people have increasing dopamine D2 receptors. And of course, as you can see, we found absolutely no difference. Then we said, well, what happens if you treat these people with a medication called valproate? Does that actually change dopamine D2 receptors? And again, we found no change. So then we said, well, if dopamine D2 receptors are not abnormal in manic patients, are they actually synthesizing? Are they making more dopamine in their uh, dopamine neurons? And to measure that, we looked at this floater dopa uptake because that gives us a, a measure of the rate of dopamine synthesis in manic patients. And again, when we measure the rate of dopamine synthesis, we found no difference between patients and healthy controls. We also looked at the effect of valproate treatment on rate of dopamine synthesis, and we actually found that following treatment with valproate, in most patients, the rate of dopamine synthesis actually went down. And here is a PET scan you can see of a patient 
which shows you the rate of dopamine synthesis before and after. You can see more brighter spots here. It becomes more duller, meaning that the rate of dopamine synthesis actually went down following treatment with the valproate. So the question then is that if you reduce dopamine transmission by blocking dopamine D2 receptors or by reducing the rate of dopamine synthesis, you're actually improving manic symptoms. So that then the question is, where is the abnormality in dopamine system in manic patients? So the next thing that we did was we looked at this dopamine transporter because what this does is that it actually is responsible for taking the dopamine that's in the synaptic space back into that presynaptic neuron. So the next study that we did was we measured the amount of this dopamine transporter in our manic patients, and finally we actually had a positive finding. So we found that patients with acute mania actually have a lower dopamine transporter density compared with age and sex match healthy controls, and we've actually found a nice correlation between the severity of manic symptoms and the amount of dopamine transporter, meaning that lower the dopamine transporter, higher the, uh, the severity of manic symptoms. So based on this, we think that if we could actually develop a drug that could enhance the reuptake of dopamine into this presynaptic neuron, you might actually be able to treat manic symptoms. So we did a literature search and we've actually found a herbal product which does that so we now partnered with an industry to synthesize this drug, which is supposed to enhance dopamine reuptake. And we just did a very preliminary study where we looked at the effect of this compound in altering the hyperactivity induced by, by a novel environment. And it does seem to have some effect. So now we're trying to test this drug in animal models of mania. And if we find the benefits, of course, the next step is to bring that to clinical trials in humans. So that's an example of how you can take something from the bench and trying to bring it to the bedside. Now let me tell you a little bit about the clinical trial studies. Um, so a lot of information that we have about bipolar disorder comes from cross-sectional studies. So for example, uh, some of the research that we have tells us that patients with the bipolar disorder are overweight or obese, uh, they have reductions in their brain volumes in terms of gray matter, white matter. They have problems with their cognition. The question is, how do we know that these are not markers of disease progression, right? And in, in order to answer that question, you really need to do studies at the disease onset, uh, which is what we've been trying to do. So we started a first episode mania program uh, where we recruit people that are experiencing a manic episode for the first time in their lives, and then we do a comprehensive clinical assessment, we assess their cognition, we do MRI scans, and then we follow them prospectively to understand the disease course and evolution. So let me tell you a few uh, findings from that cohort. The first thing is the weight story. So here you can see, based on the body mass index, we classified people into normal weight, overweight, and obese at baseline for uh, first episode patients and healthy controls. So if you just look at this graph versus this, it looks pretty similar. So bipolar patients at disease onset are not overweight or obese compared with age and sex match healthy controls. But just look at 12 months later, patients and healthy controls, you can see a lot more patients actually moved into the overweight category by 12 months compared with healthy controls. And I think what that's telling us is that a lot of medicines that we use actually make people overweight. And that's probably what we are seeing in our cross-sectional studies. Now, you might say, well, what's the big deal about making people put on a bit of weight? Well, the problem is that, as you heard from Ben Goldstein in his, in his talk, uh, increased body mass index actually correlates with reduction in brain volumes. And uh, when we looked at people that put on more weight compared with people that did not put on, we found that number of areas in the brain where we saw reductions in both gray matter and white matter. So actually putting on weight does bad things to brains. Now, we also looked at the brains of these first episode patients at the disease onset 
you know, are there any structural brain changes? And when we compared those with healthy subjects, we literally found no changes in gray matter, white matter volumes at the disease onset. But when we looked at what happens to the gray matter 12 months later, if it kept people well versus those that had a relapse, we found interesting changes. So patients that actually stayed well during the next 12 months without relapse of mood episode, they had no significant reductions in their brain gray matter volumes. But those that had a recurrence of a mood episode, here we're comparing those that had a recurrence versus those that stayed well, you can see there are a number of areas of the brain where they actually had reductions in their gray matter uh, volumes. So I think what this is suggesting is that if you could actually keep people well, you can preserve their brains, but if they have a relapse, they begin to lose their uh, brain uh, gray matter volumes. And the last story I want to tell you from this, uh, uh, from this cohort is the cognition story, because when we started the study, we were expecting first episode patients to have uh, no cognitive uh, impairments, because a lot of cross-sectional studies in bipolar patients do suggest that they have cognitive problems, but we were thinking that that's maybe because of the disease progression, uh, and, and perhaps at the disease onset, they won't have any problems. And yet, when we looked at the different domains of cognitive functioning in our first episode patients, they did actually have cognitive impairments even at the disease onset. But again, what is interesting about this is that if you actually get these people better and keep them well, you could actually reverse those cognitive deficits. So here are the cognitive data for healthy people at baseline and 12 months later, and the cognitive data for people that at a baseline that stayed well during the 12 months and those that had a relapse of the illness. And you can see those that stayed well without a relapse, their cognition is improving and they're almost catching up with healthy people. So I think the message from our first episode studies is that you've got to diagnose people early on give them the best treatment that there is and keep them well. And if you could do that, you could actually perhaps arrest the disease or arrest the neuro progression that you might see in people with a bipolar disorder. Now that's if you could identify people earlier on. But what about people that have had the illness for a period of time? Because we know people with bipolar that have had the illness for a period of time do have significant impairment in cognitive functioning. Could we do something about that? So we, as I said, we do lots of clinical trials, but I want to give you an example of a clinical trial that we did, trying to see if we can come up with a treatment that might help with improving cognitive functioning. So we did a study looking at the effect of lorazidone, which is a medication that's approved for treating bipolar depression. The reason why we looked at lorazidone was because it, it has a, a, an affinity for serotonin seven receptors in the brain, and these receptors modulate learning and memory, and that's why we were interested in this compound. So we did a study where we took a bunch of people with a bipolar disorder that had a cognitive impairment. Half of them got lorazidone in conjunction with whatever treatment that they were taking. Other patients continued the treatment as usual. And then we looked at the changes in their cognitive functioning um, six weeks later, and this is what we found. So those that had lorazidone six weeks later, as you can see, had a significant improvement in cognitive functioning, whereas those that had treatment as usual, there was no change, and you can see the significant uh, difference. This is based on the objective neuropsychological testing. We also asked people in the same study, using a questionnaire called Cognitive Failures Questionnaire, so this is a self-report, in terms of, you know, do they think that they have cognitive problems? We asked them to complete the questionnaire, and again, based on the questionnaire, we actually found that those that, have, those that were assigned to lorazidone group, there was significant improvement even in terms of the self-reported cognitive failure uh, data versus those that had treatment as usual. So this study is suggesting that lorazidone actually improves cognition in bipolar patients that have actually had the illness for uh, some period of time. This is, of course, a small study, single blind. Now we are doing a large international double blind trial to see if we can confirm these findings. And if we can, this will be the first study that will have demonstrated the effect of a medication in reversing cognitive impairment in bipolar patients. Now, the last part of the story I want to tell you is this knowledge translation story. 
And the reason, as I said earlier on, um, it, that it is important is because even though we made lots of progress in many areas, about half of the time, frontline clinicians don't necessarily get the evidence that they need to provide optimal treatment for people with various psychiatric illnesses, let alone bipolar disorder. So to address this, uh, we've actually been uh, publishing uh, treatment guidelines. We uh, first published treatment guidelines in 1997, and we've been updating these every two to three years. The most recent update was published this year in 2018. These guidelines are widely read by clinicians around the world. But one of the challenges with the guidelines, of course, is you know, these are lengthy documents. So when a physician has a patient in front of them, they don't actually have time to go, you know, go through this document to figure out which treatment is the best course of action for the patient. So we've been trying to figure out a strategy to help uh, physicians. So we've recently developed an application, an app, um, which can be used uh, with iPhones, Android phones, that actually uh, summarizes these uh, treatment guidelines as a point of care application. And we pilot tested this in Canada with about 100 physicians. So basically what happens is when a patient goes to see a physician, physicians ask to answer about a few questions about what do you think is the diagnosis, what kind of symptoms uh, the person has, are you planning to change their treatment, what are some of the concerns the person has. And as you can see, in about 50% of the cases, the patient has visited the physician because they were concerned about the efficacy of the drug. And then the physician is asked, okay, if you're going to, uh, are you planning to make a change? And then the physician is asked, okay, if you're going to make a change, what are you going to do? Right? What medication are you going to use? The physician then picks up a, uh, a particular medication. Now, if that medication is consistent with the evidence-based Canadian uh, bipolar guidelines, they get this tick mark and says, great, you're doing great, that's the right medication, give it to the patient, it's all fine. If they pick a medication that is not fully consistent, then they get this kind of alert. So for example, if they picked, let's say, something like olanzapine for treating mania, and if the patient had said she or he was uh, overweight and concerned about the weight gain, it might say, yeah, olanzapine is the right medicine, but remember the patient told you she or he is concerned at the weight gain. Do you know that olanzapine causes weight gain? You might, you might want to rethink really about it. Now, physician can still prescribe it, but it's gently reminding physician that may not be the best strategy. Or, if a physician picks a treatment that's completely inconsistent with the treatment guidelines, then they get this red alert saying that, hey, hold on, this is probably not the right strategy. This is not consistent with the guidelines. You might want to think about something else. So these are the sort of, this is the sort of gentle way of nudging clinicians about how to use the evidence-based treatments to manage their patients. So we looked at if we apply this strategy, does it actually change physician prescribing behavior? And the answer is absolutely. So when we looked at the data, you can see here in blue bars, uh, the proportion of patients that were on first-line treatments before that visit, and in red bars, proportion of patients that went on first-line treatments after the visit. And as you can see, in every situation, there was a huge change. So this is really telling us, by using a point-of-care application, you can actually change pres physicians' prescribing behavior. Now, you might say, well, does this mean that it actually leads to improved outcomes? And that's something that we're now trying to test. So we modify the app now. We've introduced the clinical global impression scale to measure the clinical outcome and also disability scale. So we're going to get that data in the future. So that's the end of my presentation. So I've tried to tell you three different stories. The first story is, how do we take some of the information that we gain from the bench, from the neurobiological research to uh, clinical translation in terms of developing new treatments? How do we take some of the clinical observations, clinical trial data to improve treatments? And lastly, how do we transfer some of the knowledge that we've learned from some of these studies to frontline clinicians? So I'm going to stop there. Happy to answer any questions. Thanks very much. Thank